Okay. Looks like we've got the recording started. Is that right, Pradeep? Yes, I started it. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and do the introductions if that's okay. And uh, then we'll take pauses so that if you need to edit the video, uh, you can. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. I'm not sure what time or where in the world you are as you're watching this. I'm in uh, Tampa, Florida. So I'm on the East Coast time zone and it's currently 10 a.m. in the morning for me. Uh, I'm happy to have you join. We're going to be covering a training series. This is the first where we're doing an overview today in a series on the SQL Server 2019 Big Data Clusters. Um, we have not decided on the product group just yet whether that will be a product, whether it will be a feature, or, or whether it will be something else. Uh, so at this point, we just call it Big Data Clusters, or BDC, uh, although most people don't like it when we do that, but I, I tend to say BDC. It's a little quicker. I, I do want to let you know that the training that we're giving you right now, you may be watching this recorded, and there'll be a series of training as we go. I'll be doing this presentation style, so you should be able to see my screen. And what's going to happen is I'm going to give you some assignments that's going to follow each week. We're going to do an hour long of this. Today is the overview, and then you'll want to follow through with the training. So today is a complete overview of everything. And then in the training that follows, we'll go through every single module one at a time. I'm going to provide you a full training course, and you may work ahead if you wish, but it's best if you stick with the schedule that we have. You should know that we're currently at CTP 2.4. Uh, the training material is actually set for CTP 2.3. So everything I'm telling you may change slightly, uh, but the general big things that we'll be talking about will be the same, some of the syntax and so on. Now, what I'll be doing is I'll be updating the training that I'll show you on the website that I'll show you to the latest versions as a major version changes, and I'll tell you more about that. So far, everything we're talking about is actually public, so you're allowed to say everything unless I say something like, hey, you wanna be careful here, or uh, this may not work yet, or we're planning. Uh, so you wanna use those terms as you're speaking with your customers. Um, let's talk about how we handle questions. I'm not gonna be taking chat questions. We're gonna be moving too quickly for that. So here's how we're gonna do this. When we're done with today, as you have questions, uh, pop open a notepad or OneNote and get those written down uh, for your questions and then mail them to me, buck.woody at microsoft.com, uh, B-U-C-K period W-O-O-D-Y at microsoft.com. What I will do is gather those questions together and in the next module that we talk about, I'll answer them. That way, people who are watching recorded may get their questions answered real time as well. So let's get started. By the way, I will make available to you this entire deck if you would like it. You'll notice it has very plain formatting. That's so if you wish to rebrief someone, you can. You can simply take the deck and change it uh, to your liking. All right, let's get started. Um, we normally start out this overview session with talking about why we did this. So this is important. Uh, from your perspective, if a customer is attempting to use the product incorrectly, it will cause issues. So it's best to know why we're doing this. And we start out with talking about the big data landscape. And what we mean here is that because there's been easier ways to get and to store data, we're storing more data. Not only that, the other issue we have is that there is external data your customers may need to get to that they don't currently store. So those are the two main problems we're trying to solve in general in the whole industry, not just Microsoft, but Google and, and everyone else is trying to solve this as well. And we've been doing this longer, so we've got a lot more data. And as an example, by the way, uh, there's a company called Walmart here in the United States. It's a very large chain of sales stores, and they take in 1.5 petabytes of data per hour uh, as you buy things. That's a lot of data. Uh, they have five Hadoop clusters that they use uh, to process this kind of data. It's, it's rather stunning. In the deck that you'll see here, uh, the PowerPoint deck, in the notes section, there's a link that will show you how they're handling big data. So we do have uh, big data in the world today. 
And once we know that, there are various things we can do with it. Uh, we're all familiar with just querying big data and doing business intelligence type work and so on. But machine learning in specific and AI that comes out of that and certainly deep learning that comes out of that uh, also needs huge amounts of data. And a lot of times data that may not appear to be um, naturally joined in some way. For instance, you may want to combine your shipping information with traffic conditions and even weather conditions as well. So you may have those things that are happening at the same time. Putting those together can be quite large. Now, what I've done here is you're not meant to have to read the fonts, by the way. I know they're very small and I don't like that. But uh, the general idea here is there are various industry sectors that have been using big data quite often. Uh, I've listed them and this is sort of, at least at the time I put this together, this is in order. So retail does the most inside big data, finance and then healthcare and so on. Inside each of those, there are some primary use cases that are happening. Uh, retail does a lot of demand prediction. For them, it's very important to be able to get the products that you wanna buy at the time you want to buy them, but not before and certainly not after. Uh, I used to live in Seattle in the United States of America. And at one point, uh, the, the uh, weather in Seattle never got very warm, uh, but they've had uh, with the global change in climate, they've had far hotter summers. And so people have begun to buy air conditioners. And one of the things that Seattle does very poorly is demand prediction. Uh, when uh, June hits, uh, or July hits up in Seattle, suddenly you can't find a fan or an air conditioner anywhere. And so they could certainly benefit. Most of those stores could benefit from some demand prediction. In finance, we see uh, it used to be fraud detection was the main thing we looked for, but um, that's actually been changed to most things are done inside cyber attack. So the point is, uh, if your customers are in any of these verticals, these industry sectors, you may want to familiarize yourself by going out and going to the web, typing in big data or machine learning, uh, retail, uh, supply chain optimization, and then you'll be kind of familiar with the problems they're, they're trying to solve. So once again, we have big data, and, and secondly, we can, we can use big data. So uh, once we know that, and that's fairly obvious, and by the way, we're gonna go into great depth in the first module on this stuff exactly, there's only certain ways to solve big data. And, and essentially what this means is breaking apart the storage and the uh, processing of that storage. So if we uh, gave you a math problem to solve, you'd be able to take out your paper and pencil and solve the problem. But if I were to say, here's 10,000 math problems to solve and I want the answers back and I sit in the back office waiting for you to finish, that's a problem. So what we can do is we can take those math problems and give a thousand of them to 10 people. And then you've got 10 people working on a thousand problems. And as they're done and they give me the answers, someone could put those answers together and then give me the final answer. And that's literally the way it works. And as I had more people, I can get more work done. If I had 10,000 people, I could get 10,000 things done at once, and then I'd have to aggregate them back. And this is exactly how we do it inside machine learning. Uh, and we do this with a very famous product called Hadoop. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with this, but essentially what we see are the map reduce which is simply breaking the problem into pieces. Then we distribute that over some sort of redundant storage called the Hadoop distributed file system. The work is done and sent back and aggregated during the reduce phase. And this is all done with a middle layer that controls everything. And this one happens to be called Yarn. Yet another resource node is the name of that one. So I think we're familiar with this construct and how it works. And this has been very famous and we have HD Insight inside SQL Server, uh, excuse me, inside uh, Azure and so on. Now, there's an issue uh, with this approach. And the issue is that it's, that it's quite batch oriented. I have to distribute my problem to all the folks that are gonna do the work and then sit back and wait for it. What if I could get that a little faster? What if I made you smarter? And what if I were to do some tricks around caching and so on? And because of this, a product called Spark was invented. 
Spark is interesting, and we'll talk about it in great depth next week, uh, but the or in the next session, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, Spark is a set of libraries and it doesn't care about where the data is. So the blue portion there at the bottom, that's equivalent to the HDFS. Not only can it use HDFS, but it can use other storage processing systems. It gives you a series of libraries that you can use to walk over that data quickly. And it does this at the very base with something called a resilient uh, distributed data frame or RDD. And the RDD is in a raw object type format. And so when we begin to work with it, we normally work with an RDD. But then as we begin to do data exploration and feature engineering and the other things that you want to do inside machine learning or artificial intelligence, we need to change it into more of a tabular uh, format, something we're more familiar with inside the SQL world. And so that's done uh, with a, a thing called a data frame. And so there are libraries that can cast things into data frames. You're going to see all this today uh, in the quick overview. And from there, uh, we can also then turn it back into another kind of object that uh, things like Python and R like to work with. And those are called data sets, interestingly enough. R and Python normally talk about things like data frames, not quite the same as the data frame that we're talking about in Spark here. So this is a quick overview of how those things sort of work. So we have big data, we've got ways to work with big data, and then we've got tools that allow us to do that at scale. So that's where we're at right now. All right, moving on. We're getting there. Uh, don't get me wrong. We're getting there. You're like, what's this got to do with SQL? Um, so what we do from there now is we've got lots of ways to get lots of people doing lots of math problems. Uh, but building a new computer every time we want to add capacity and then getting rid of the computer is obviously not smart to do physically. We want to virtualize this. And so a technology was invented that you all know well called virtualization. And that makes use of something called a hypervisor. And a hypervisor provides four things back to this machine that's going to run CPU, disk, network, and memory. The same thing you would see inside a physical computer, but it does it in this layer of the hypervisor. Now what we're able to do is install an operating system on the hypervisor, but not a physical computer. And now it just becomes a file that we can ship around. And this is great because we can copy them and we can move them and so on. But they're also quite large. And, and not only that, we don't need all of the operating system. I don't need all of Windows or all of Unix to do the work I need to do. I, I really just need the SQL Server or the MongoDB or the Python script. I just need that part to run. So would there be a way that would be a little easier to work with than simply virtualizing something? And in fact, there is. And, and so this idea called containers came out. And, and the big container uh, vendor at the moment is a, is a product called Docker. Uh, and Docker is available uh, on Windows and Linux, but we're going to focus on the Linux world for now. Containers go the next level. So whereas the hypervisor says, I've got a CPU disk network and memory, here you go. The container does not do that. It basically says, I have the ability to run programs. That's what I can do. I can run Python and I can run R and I can run lots of things. And you don't have to worry about CPU, disk, network, and memory. I'll handle that. Just don't worry about it. Now, storage is another matter. We'll, we'll come back to that. But the point now is I can simply have a small manifest. It's done inside YAML, yet another markup language, another kind of JSON, XML text file. Uh, and what it does for you is I can describe the kind of container I want. And it's interesting. It builds it in layers. So as I run the Docker technology, the Docker technology runs and it will grab what's called an image and an image has within it all of the binaries and things I need to work with. Docker will tear that apart and put it into layers. It'll say, you know, I already have Python, so I'm not going to get that again. I already have that library. I'm not going to get it again, but I don't have that that they're running. So I'll grab just that one. And so it builds this image from the thing that you've asked for, and then it starts it up, and that's called a container. So once again, we have a Docker compose file, which will build an image 
and then the image running is called a container. So we've got the Docker runtime that's running a container, and these are quite small, very small, and they're declarative. I can simply say, go do this, and they'll go do it. Now, this is exciting uh, because what I can now do is run thousands of these, tens of thousands of these, and I could even start them up and turn them off just takes seconds. I've got one running on my machine here today, and I'll show you some interesting things about uh, how that container information is working. Now, as with anything else, when you have thousands of things um, they, and they're easy to get, if you go to the dollar store and you're able to buy lots of junk, you buy lots of junk. And so when we have a lot of containers, there's a lot of containers running around. And so we need some way to orchestrate those. And so yet another product was invented. This one's called Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is a Greek word that means pilot. Um, and what this does is it organizes the containers. It, it really does two things for us, or, or maybe three. The first is it organizes containers. So that's the first part. It can manage and organize those. The second thing it can do is it can handle storage for us a little better than a raw container does. Because as you can imagine, if I turn off a container, then anything it was storing is gone. So I need a way to kind of take care of that and put it somewhere else. I don't think I want that in an ethereal come up, come down container kind of world. The third thing it does for us is it is declarative. Now, this is super important to know. Inside SQL, that's a declarative language. I say, I'd like a table. I do not have to go in and write uh, the code that says where that's stored. Uh, I open and close the file. I take these locks. I simply say, create table, and it handles it. Same concept here in Kubernetes. I say, I'd like a group of containers that looks like this. And that's done inside a Kubernetes file. Once again, files. I say, go do that. It handles all of the above. So here we go. The first thing is we're familiar with the Docker technology. So the first thing that Kubernetes does is it stands up something called um, a, a pod. Uh, and a pod is simply something that's running a container. Now, it has to be running somehow. Uh, so the next concept we need to think about is the idea of a node, N-O-D-E. This is either a virtual PC or it's a regular physical computer. Uh, they work exactly the same, and they contain just a couple or three things. First thing they contain is something called a kubelet, uh, which tells it it's part of Kubernetes. The second thing it contains is a kube proxy, which is a networking layer, and I'll tell you why that's important in just a moment. But the third thing we know already is Docker. So now there's a virtual computer or a computer running Docker, that can stand up lots of containers and put a border around them called a pod. So now inside my Kubernetes command, I can say, hey, Kubernetes, and it's done with the kube, K-U-B-E, C-T-L, kube cuddle command. And the kube cuddle command will simply say, I'd like uh, the following nodes to run the following containers, go. The interesting thing is because it's declarative, Kubernetes handles moving these things around. It literally says, I think I'll put that over here and that over here uh, within the nodes you specified. And uh, I'll handle where it's at by using the kubelet and the kube proxy. You don't have to worry about that. You simply ask for the container you want, I'll go find it, which is a little spooky for us because we're used to dealing with something very specific. So the nodes and the pods are in here inside, uh, or rather the pods are inside the node and the containers are inside the pods. Uh, so now we, we need to talk about what a cluster is. And this is simply a group of nodes, a whole bunch of things running at one time that are grouped together. Each one of them has at least the kubelet, the kube proxy and the Docker, all of them have that. But there's a very special one, by the way, called the Kubernetes master. And this is a node we talk to that talks to everything else. And it does that over the kubelet and the kube proxy. So that's kind of the way these things lay out. Now, one of the things I need to mention here is I'll be showing some physical hexagons uh, with the words node in them and so on. 
that's a, a bit dangerous uh, because these things tend to move around and you can't always say where things are, uh, but we have to draw it somehow. So know that there may not be a node with three containers in it and so on uh, that has them those pods. Just This is just for graphical illustration purposes. There's one last concept we need to talk about inside Kubernetes. We're going to go in depth in the later training, but uh, basically the idea here is what do we do with storage? And the way we deal with storage is through something called a volume. Kubernetes has the ability to mount storage somewhere else. And you can think of this uh, mounting as, as a claim. And you can think of that like a, almost like a, a sort of a SAM, if you will, a storage area network. It's kind of a software wire that says the storage is over here and this pod or node or, or uh, container makes a claim against it. Now, here's what's interesting about that. If I were, or rather if Kubernetes were, to destroy a pod or destroy a container and bring it up somewhere else, as long as the claim goes with it, the storage is remounted automatically. And that makes it very interesting as we begin to think about use cases for this kind of environment. And so as we think about that, uh, there are a couple kinds of volumes. Uh, the first kind of volume is just called a volume. And the second one is called a persistent volume. And what that means is even if I cut Kubernetes off, I don't want to lose that thing. Uh, so we're going to come back to that as we go through our concepts here later. Hopefully this is clear so far. We have big data. We have use cases for big data. We have a way to process big data by breaking up the processing and the storage. We have a way to do that easily within virtualization. And now we have an easier way to do that within containers or Docker. And now we have a way to manage Docker with Kubernetes. All right, so that's where we are right now so far. We're just doing the overview here. Uh, as we think about Kubernetes though, you might use it for something. Um, let's say we've got a shopping cart application and we'd like to scale that automatically. We could tell Kubernetes, uh, here's our master node, we have to have that. And then once that's done, we could say, I would like some pods uh, that have a container that's running a web-based application. It's very pretty and I want lots of them. We could think of these as our mathematicians that we've given all this work to, all the people sitting at their desk doing the work we've asked. We could think of them that way. Then we probably need a way in the middle, uh, this is pretty common, to do business logic. This might be something like uh, don't sell things that aren't in uh, inventory, right? That's a normal thing that we would put in sort of an N tier or a three tier architecture, a very common thing to do. So we might have some more nodes with some more pods, with some more containers that are handling the business logic and these guys can all talk to each other. And then we need somewhere to store things. Now we could just store it on the hard drive or we could use MongoDB or we could use uh, MySQL, we could use anything. Uh, and we'll put that in the data tier. So this is a very common generic Kubernetes cluster. And you might ask, well, who's using this stuff and is it real and does it really scale and does it really work? Um, Gmail uh, is actually based on Kubernetes. Uh, so they're running a monstrous Kubernetes cluster, and you can imagine uh, that that's quite large and deals with a lot of things at one time, uh, pretty much all of these elements and more uh, inside there. So it's real world. Um, there are various container technologies. There are various orchestration technologies. Docker and Kubernetes have sort of won the day. Uh, there's another layer just above this one uh, with a product called OpenShift which makes this even easier. We'll talk about that later. We'll do that when we talk about the module for installation, which we'll actually cover after you do your installation, and I'll explain why later. All right, so um, how, where does this leave SQL Server? So we've now got all of our ingredients. Big data is out there. We can use it with stuff. We have a way to process it. We know how not to do that on computers. We know how to have containers and we know how to orchestrate those containers. So we have all those ingredients, but Buck, you've been talking all about Linux, right? You've been talking about Linux and SQL Server doesn't run on Linux, but actually, as you know, I'm sure it, it does. We've always had SQL Server running inside Windows. That's, that's its legacy and it's been doing that. So what we did, just in case you're not familiar with this, and again, I apologize if I'm talking down to anyone that already knows these things, uh, but I've got to make sure we're all clear. Um, we had a couple of folks uh, inside SQL team that said, where does SQL Server talk 
to Windows? Because there's a couple ways we could do this. We could have taken SQL Server and rewritten it to run on another operating system. But of course, every operating system is slightly different. You've got distributions inside Linux and you've got mainframe languages and so on. And so it becomes uh, really interesting to try to maintain co two code bases and does this one get ported to that and does that feature work? So it becomes a little difficult. You could run an emulation layer. I don't know if you've ever used the product called Wine, W-I-N-E, uh, inside uh, uh, Linux, Ubuntu, or other flavors. Um, if you do, you'll realize that it's pretty, um, it's pretty bad. It doesn't work uh, exceptionally well. It's very slow, even when it does work. It's terribly slow. So we said, no, that's probably not going to work, especially for something that needs to perform well. So they took a look at the code itself for SQL Server, the actual down in the binary code, and they said, what if we took a look at every place that SQL Server makes a call out to the operating system layer, CPU, disk, networking, storage, makes a call down into the kernel? How many places does it do that? And we thought it'd be quite a bit. And, and it turns out it wasn't as many as we thought. It was actually fewer than we thought. And it was it was certainly possible to take all of those places where it touches the hardware and touches the operating system and touches the kernel and trim those out and say, let's, let's cut them away and then right away put a shim layer right back in that allows this layer that, this, that SQL would talk to to then talk to an operating system. And we did that. And it was called the PAL, the Platform Abstraction Layer. And what this allows us to do now is we can simply adjust the PAL on the other side. And now we can talk to other languages while SQL, the actual code for SQL, remains the same binary code in all of the different operating systems. Now, not everything fits in the PAL. Uh, the engine certainly does. Other portions do. Um, and with some work, uh, things like machine learning services and so on can even work in this world. Uh, but you're not going to get things like uh, reporting services or or other analysis services to be in this PAL layer, at, at least yet. Uh, we actually have a couple of things that might surprise you um, uh, that are working inside the PAL, and you'll see more of those announcements come out. All right. So now we can work inside Linux. We can actually, and we've been able to do this, as, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, since SQL 2017. Um, and we've kept making investments in that. And when we made investments in that, we found, you know what else you could do? Uh, you could actually then, because we can run now in other operating systems, one of those could be containers. So now we're able to deploy SQL Server on a container and uh, it's it's incredibly quick to do. Uh, you can have and install a SQL Server in less than five minutes. Uh, that's literally downloading everything and standing it up and you can cut one off, uh, mount the storage and then bring up another one that mounts that same storage and you can do an upgrade in just minutes or seconds. Uh, so it's a brave new world with these containers. And it allows us to do lots of things. Containers run on premises, as you know, they run in the cloud. And then this allows us to also have hybrid. And again, from the perspective, and, and I'll prove this, by the way, let me pop over. I've got Management Studio open. Hopefully you can see this right now. Uh, I'm going to pop in here and I'm going to zoom in here real for you real quick. You can see there, you can see on my local registration, I've got Docker 2019 and assuming I've started it, I believe I have. Um, yeah, there we go. So I've actually got Docker running and you can see um, I can run a new query. Uh, uh, we can run the ADAT version here, our favorite super uh, easy query that always works. Um, and you can see uh, I'll zoom in for you here in just a second. Let me get this to you that I'm actually running on um, uh, developer edition 64 bit on Linux um, on Ubuntu 16.04 uh, is what I'm running right now inside that one. So the point is that we've got this world where we can run SQL inside containers. So all right. Now we finally get to sort of the entire point uh, of this ramble that I was just doing. 
we can take all of the things that we've seen and put them together to solve the original problem we had, which is the big data. So here we go. This is the part I think you'll care about the most. Uh, and I'm going to pop out here into demo world quite a bit, and then we'll be done for today. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we're going to do in the sessions that follow. All right. You, do you remember this? This is simply the uh, diagram I had from before with different colors. Uh, we got our Kubernetes master. Remember, we had a web based application and then we had a business logic tier and then we had a data tier. We sort of have our multi tier application. So this is the way Kubernetes works today for thousands of companies around the world. Well, it's open source. And so we said, you know what we could do? We could actually take that same construct. Uh, the first thing we could do is we can simply install SQL Server inside this cluster of Kubernetes and we can run it as if it's SQL Server. So let's just let's just prove that. So I actually have a cluster going here uh, and let me show you that inside here. Um, you can see that I've got uh, an IP address and then a comma and then a rather interesting uh, TCP IP port and that'll become important later. But the point is I can now also run a query um, in, in here uh, that we'll see. Um, let me just run one real quick, a uh, new query. I'm sorry, a new query, here we go. Uh, let's just do our, our super hard query. Uh, let's do our version in here and let's see what we get back here. Uh, inside, again, I'm, I'm connected to a, a cluster. And if you'll notice, um, this one's currently running CTP 2.2 and you can see that I'm running once again on Linux Ubuntu. Uh, here, uh, there, and there you can see that as well. So the idea is that I've actually got, once again, that same thing we just did in a container, I just did against a container that's in a Kubernetes cluster. So now we have SQL running in this declarative cluster that I simply said, I'd love to have a SQL server that looks like this, and it just did that for me, and it did it on the Azure Kubernetes service. Now we'll talk more about where else you can install it. You probably see that I'm running a mini kube cluster here locally on my system. Uh, you could also install it on a regular Kubernetes cluster internally, and then I'm sure we'll get some questions as to where else uh, can I run it, right? So we can do this today. Now I've got everything I normally do. This is just regular old SQL. So this is the first method we use this, what we call uh, high value data. I'm, I'm unaware of low value data, but there we are. Uh, they call it high value online transaction processing. So here there's really no difference. Um, we've got uh, typical relational data. We've got multi types. We've got our graph database features. We've got machine learning services up. No code change. This just looks like SQL, uh, but it's again running in Linux running in a container, running in a Kubernetes cluster. All right, so that that's not too earth shattering. Let's start putting it together with a few other things that are a little bit more interesting. This is our typical Kubernetes cluster. You remember this one, and this is what I just showed you. I just showed you that uh, within uh, the Kubernetes cluster, we can actually have a series of what we call planes, P-L-A-N-E, and these planes are control, compute, and data. Now, interestingly enough, if you start thinking about this, this looks a great deal like how we solved big data. Remember that? We had distributed compute, and that's here. Uh, we had distributed storage, and that's here. And then we sort of had a distributed uh, way to manage all this, and that's the control plane. So this looks a lot like the concepts within Hadoop. It isn't Hadoop, but it's the concepts that we saw there. So once again, inside this Kubernetes cluster, we simply said we'd like to have some nodes. Now I've Again, I want to be very careful here. I've stood up a certain number of these just for conceptual sake. It may not look like this. In fact, the Kubernetes cluster you just saw that I just hit is actually just three nodes. Uh, and you can deploy it all on one node and you can deploy it on lots more nodes and so on. Um, but this is just conceptual just to show you how this works. All right. This is what I showed you. If I want to talk to SQL Server, I now have a Kubernetes cluster. I talk to SQL Server and to the user and to the developer, no changes have been made. 
But let's assume uh, we want to actually work with this cluster a little better. We, we've stood up some other things inside the control plane. The first of them is a SQL cluster administration portal. And I'm going to bring that up when we get to the management and monitoring module for our training. I'll bring that up there. Um, they're using two uh, technologies that you'll need to be aware of. One is called Grafana, and it's a graphical tool that lets you look at spinning dials and so on. And the other one's called Kibana. And Kibana is sort of a log reader, if you will, and will let you query logs. And it's very pretty and very powerful. Uh, the reason you'll need to know these specifically in support is you may uh, want to go straight to those logs and start looking at things. I, I would imagine you're going to be living in there quite quite a bit and inside Grafana as well as you explain this to your users. Now, do they have to know how to do this? No, we, we're actually going to abstract that for them. We've got a, a cluster administration portal I'll show you. So it's a very pretty interface and they can simply click around and then we go down to these objects for them so they don't have to do that. Again, if you have questions, uh, be scribbling those down on the notepad there and then mail all those to me. And then when we have our next session, uh, we'll, uh, our next uh, thing, we'll, we'll go over those uh, together. Uh, now we're not done. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you these real quick, but you're just gonna think about them for a quick moment as we come back. There's something that you care about a great deal called the Knox Gateway. Knox is another open source. You can see everything in black here is open source, and everything in orange is something that Microsoft wrote. But the Knox Gateway is important because eventually we're gonna wanna talk to things other than SQL Server. And if we don't talk to SQL Server, we're going to talk to them through the Knox Gateway. You can think of it as the portal into which we're gonna talk everything else. Livy and Hive, I'll come back to in just a bit. Now, um, I can query out of the SQL Server Master, and you've seen that, and that works just fine. Uh, but what if I would like to query something really, really, really big? Uh, if I'd like to do something like that, I may want to distribute my compute. I may want more people answering the math problems, and that's these. They're called the compute pool. They're yet again SQL servers that are running inside a node, that are running inside a pod, that are running inside a container because we've seen SQL Server runs in a container. But you, uh, meaning the user that's typing something, does you do not talk to these servers at all. You don't have to. Uh, you simply talk to the SQL Server master and say, I'd like some stuff, and it will handle scaling out the processing for you. Now, you as part of CSS will need to know uh, a lot more about how this is happening because you'll see things in the logs but again, we're going to handle that over in the Kibana dashboard uh, in just a bit. All right. So what if we would like to talk to data that is either outside of SQL Server? You know, how have we done this? Well, we used to do this with uh, linked servers and things like that. Not terribly fast or efficient and, and certainly no predicate pushdowns, right? We don't use the power of the receiving system. We simply query it and hope it gives us back stuff in a timely manner. Well, we've invented, and I'm sure you've dealt with before, a concept called polybase, and we're going to continue that on, and we've beefed it up a bit inside the master instance. And so what can happen now is I can simply declare that this table lives somewhere, a table lives somewhere else. And the interesting thing is we've built something called connectors, and these connectors will simply, they natively know how to talk to these other systems. And they will simply run out to those systems, talk to them, and grab the data they need. Now, what's interesting is perhaps that data is in uh, Oracle, or perhaps it's in Teradata, or perhaps it's even uh, running against HDFS. Uh, if it does that, I need a way when I write a SQL query up here in the SQL master, because that's all I talk to, I need for some way for that to end up turning into a Java job, a pig job, or a hive job over in HDFS. And I don't want to have to learn pig and hive to do this work. I just want SQL to handle it, and it will. That's what the polybase connectors do. So let me show you how this sort of works. You talk to the SQL Server master and create an external data source and then an external data type. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And we're going to learn how to do that in our, in our workshop. Uh, and then it will then go through the compute pool to talk out to that particular system based on where you said it was. If it's Oracle, it talks to Oracle and so on. The response then comes back 
through the master instance and you merely get the data back there. That's the way this thing sort of works. So um, I think what we'll do is I'll go ahead and, and digress for just a moment and show you that. So let me pop over here. Um, here is the external table. You can see this one is actually going against um, a storage pool. What in the world is this? We haven't talked about that yet, but we will in a moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk to HDFS, but I'm going to treat it as if it's a table. So I'm just run this and uh, assuming everything all works well, and it did, uh, I went out to an HDFS source that quickly, and I got product reviews from HDFS. Well, that's just crazy. Uh, and here's another part. Uh, we can create another table called Oracle. Now, you'll notice that the data source says Oracle source, data source, uh, SQL data pool, and so on. Those, I'm going to show you inside the database here. I'm going to click here and expand my databases. I'll zoom in in just a moment when I get to the location uh, where it matters. And if you'll notice, I've got a couple of external resources. So I'm going to pop in here. And you can see, well, that didn't work, did it? Uh, I probably want to use the uh, control one. Now everybody knows what was in my email. Um, you can see that I've got some external uh, uh, data sources, and I've also got some external data formats. And so once I've done that, I can now go out and I can select from things like Oracle and so on. Let me see if I've got that wired up. I don't know if that one's still wired up. I believe it is. Let's go see. Um, there's my Oracle customer. So I went out to Oracle and I grabbed the customers from there. So, so far I've gone out to um, my product reviews and I've gone out to Oracle and I've grabbed some data. And we're gonna see how I can now in one place uh, get my product reviews my customer first names, interjoin my web sales that I've made in Wide World Importers <clears throat> on the item number with the Oracle customers that was provided to me and the HDFS information where the product equals this, and I'm gonna order that by the first name. So uh, again, crossing fingers here, uh, this, this works most of the time. Now let's see if it does today. Uh, but the idea here is I'm able from a Transact SQL statement to run across uh, four different data sources that you saw there, both internal, a view, an Oracle system, and HDFS. Put all those there together and get that ADA, uh, put some things together for me, um, and told me about this item number that she liked. Now, interestingly enough, um, I'm going somewhere with this because, okay, so I can do this, that's fine. This is definitely a use case, but there's other use cases uh, we might want, and my friend Anna put together for me uh, a Java sentiment uh, program so that I can now run across that data and do machine learning on it. So let's, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I get excited about this stuff. So let's, um, let's pop back over to our diagram. Now, I, I showed you that whole data pool and storage pool and all that. What in, what in the world was all that? Well, what if I wanted to go and get all that data, but it's changing? People are putting things inside the Hadoop system and the Oracle system, and it's changing. But I want to keep it, but it's a lot of data. Uh, I could store it in a database and fill that up, or I could make this new idea inside the data plane called the SQL data pool. Now, what is this? Well, guess what? It's yet more nodes uh, with yet more pods with yet more containers, uh, but these containers in SQL Server, yes, again, uh, but these containers have an interesting side effect they have mounted multiple databases they have mounted multiple databases and present them as one so now i've got a sharded set of databases that a single sql server will talk to and i can have lots of those sql servers so here's the progression i can simply go out talk to the data through polybase once again just using the master instance get the query we just saw and then store the data inside the data pool. Uh, and so that will automatically persist it and I can have kind of a data mark. Maybe I want to do some ETL on that. Maybe I want to uh, only get certain columns. Maybe I want to get more columns and join data together. I now have that available. That's sort of frozen in time. I can still do my query out to those external sources, but I can now also query directly the data pool. Again, I don't have to query the data pool. I query the master instance 
and tell it where the data pool is. Let me show you that because that's once again a little a little voodoo magic. I'm going to switch tools on you here, um, and I'm going to show you where me working through these examples here uh, shortly. But I'm going to go to a specific tutorial um, where I have gone out and I've created this data virtualization, and you can see here I'm I'm using the Wide World importers. And I'm selecting from these uh, formats here and I'm going and getting some data and you can see that it's just a standard set of data that I've gone after here and this happens to be external to where I am but I'd like to keep that data I actually want to, to keep that data somewhere so what I can do is I can look at the data from inside HDFS this is out on Hadoop and uh, I say I like that and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create something in the data pool, the one I just showed you, and I tell it where it is. This is how that happens, just like that. And we'll get into these terms in just a bit. This is the overview. And then I'll once again create an external table that has all of the web click data. This is what I'm going after in this external table that's being fed from a web log. Every day they're just shoving in thousands and thousands of web logs but they delete them after a while and I want to keep some of them. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab the data and I'm simply going to put it. Now we're doing currently in CTP 2.3, we're doing it with a stored procedure. In CTP 2.4, we've changed this to just be a regular old insert into statement. So it looks like every other part of SQL. The point is, after I do that, I can simply go get from the data pool. I don't have to go back to the HDFS. I'm going to the data pool and you can see I, I currently have uh, 512,000 uh, items in there and that may change. And you can see I, I just grabbed the top 10 of those. And so now I have the frozen in time, but in a data mart, which I could have, by the way, what you would normally do with something like this, Perhaps I would aggregate these. Um, I'd get the number of clicks by user and get the unique click count so I could do maybe the hottest products or, or something like that. I'm, I'm using the Azure Data Studio, by the way, and we're going to be getting into this tool uh, a bit later, but I just kind of wanted to show you that. All right. So last piece, last piece, I promise. Uh, that we'll cover today uh, is the storage pool. Now, you've seen this a couple of times. Remember, I can use Polybase to go out and talk to HDFS that lives somewhere else, like I've got a Hadoop cluster running in another place. But what if I would like to stay within the boundary of my Kubernetes cluster, and I would like to talk to HDFS directly? Well, I can do that. Uh, what if I'd like not only to do that, but I'd also like for things like, I don't know, that Spark thing we talked about an hour ago. What if I'd like that available within this same cluster? Could, could you make me a node with a pod and, and a container that's running Spark? And we can do that. And could you make an HDFS layer in here, a pod and a node that's running HDFS for me? Yes, we can. And we went even one step further. We put into the database engine, the open source ability to talk to Parquet and CSV files in HDFS natively. So now the engine itself can run queries across HDFS. Let me show you how we did that. Uh, basically what that means is I'm now running a node called the storage pool, and I can have more than one, but we're just gonna stick with one for the moment. And I've stood up a pod in there and that's got SQL Server on it. And I stood up another pod in there and that's called Spark. And I've got both of those able to talk to HDFS that I'm running as well. That means inside the SQL Server master up there at the top, I can ask for HDFS, not over on some Hadoop cluster, although I can do that too, but I can ask for it from SQL itself. And that's called the storage pool. Let me go back over to the um, diagram here, or rather the uh, code here, and show you uh, where I did that. See that? Product reviews, do you see that right there? Storage pool, that's that. That is that. Let me, I can even show you, we've got a couple minutes here. I can even show you sort of where that lives. So I've got the, the cluster open that shows that. Here's my Spark cluster. It's got HDFS on it, you can see. And inside that, I've got clickstream data. And I think I said product reviews, right? So I can come in here 
and there's product reviews inside HDFS. Because that's in the storage pool, it's local. So I can go get HDFS data somewhere else with Polybase, but not using Polybase. I can come down here and natively talk to these product reviews simply by running code uh, that looks like uh, that looks like this. Create external table, product reviews, and I give it the format that I'm looking for, and I say it's this, it's in here. Notice that's just a directory. So tons and tons and thousands and millions of files are being put in that directory. They all look the same. It happens to be in a storage pool, and I created a file format called comma separated value uh, that knows what the layout should look like. And I'll show you how to create that as we go along in our in our work. Then I can simply uh, go query it. I can simply say go down to the storage pool and I'm talking to the master instance. Go down to the storage pool, read from that directory and treat it like it's a SQL server table. And as you saw, I can then uh, combine that with with other data. And you can see I've done exactly the same thing there. So very exciting technologies that I can do. Um, one final piece on here. You'll notice there's a, a, a slightly darker uh, icon here. And what that means is that HDFS has the distributed storage that we talked about. We've actually created the ability for HDFS to talk to another HDFS. And so what we can do is we can simply mount another HDFS as if it's a directory on this HDFS. So once again, not using Polybase, but we can also do that. Uh, we can mount the directory inside HDFS and simply traverse it that way. Uh, so you can deal with monstrously large sets of data, monstrously large sets of data. All right, the rest of this deck, and I'm just gonna walk through it fairly quickly, um, basically covers what I just showed you in, in one slide. So here's the, the Uber master diagram. Let's just focus on these parts here, just these parts here. And then they, they look like this. You know, you go out and you query it and it goes out there. And, and, and you saw this a moment ago. And then um, this is another view of sort of how it does that. And I explain normally the different kind of connectors that we have available. And then the data mart, which is I want to do that exact same thing, but this time I'd like to sort of keep it. We then focus in on adding in the SQL data pool. And you can see here, I simply talk to the master, which talks to the compute pool, which gets the data and puts it in the data pool. So again, I simply talk to the master. It's just regular old SQL. And here's another view of sort of how that works. And this one shows in particular the sharding effect of those databases that are mounted. Once again, you don't have to talk to them, you talk to the master. And then I normally show you an example of that, but we've already sort of done that. And what if you wanna do everything? Uh, we have this big diagram and we keep it all because we're gonna use it, but I've added in something you haven't seen and we'll end on this today, uh, the app pool. So we can stand up yet another node with yet more uh, pods and more containers and those can be things like a machine learning server that you can answer queries and scores, a web application perhaps. And as I told you, you might be surprised about, uh, we've got the PAL working with uh, SSIS jobs. Uh, so you don't get the GUI, but you do get the, DTF, uh, the DT exec commands uh, to run those there. So very interesting stuff. That's called the application pool. Here's the way that lays out. Basically, the users query multiple sorts of data that we saw in data virtualization. Perhaps you store some of that, and then the user would like to get a score. So the data scientist, she creates a notebook, a Jupyter notebook, and she hits, and this ties it all up, the Knox gateway uh, to do the work. I'm going to show you that as we get out. And then we'll come back and go through our management and monitoring, uh, and then we'll be done uh, sort of for today. Let me show you this last notebook I have here. So in here, all I'm doing inside Spark is I'm simply reading from the product reviews. Uh, I'm then just writing out the top product reviews is what I'm doing. You could do all sorts of things here. Uh, Spark can scale dramatically. And then I would simply use Spark SQL, or I could have used PySpark, or I could have used any number of languages that it supports, Spark R and so on, Sparkly R. And I could simply go after that data frame that we talked about way early on. Uh, and I can even see what's going on here. Let me, let me pop in here and let, let's see if my job finished. I had some jobs I kicked off earlier. I'm just going to double click this to manage it. 
and you can see here's my Spark cluster. I'm just going to take a look at my yarn. Remember yarn that we talked about? Let's take a look at our yarn history here. Uh, and you can see that my job is currently running. This one is. So remember the Livy I showed you? Well, there's the Livy sessions that you can see here. Uh, you can see the Livy uh, sessions I'm running inside my Spark cluster. And it says it's not quite done. So I'll just pop over here into the application master and I can see the various jobs that I'm running and where they're at. I can see the stages they're at. I can take a look at the executors um, and not only just the executors, but I can also see the uh, places that it's running and I can even tear down the uh, explain plan, if you will, and I can start looking uh, at the descriptions of my jobs and so on. So you can see we've got a, a very complex system, but we're trying to make it as uncomplicated as possible. All right, I'm gonna leave you one last thing, and this is your homework for next module. Um, uh, let me see if I've got the link. Yes, I want you to go to aka.ms forward slash SQL workshops. I'm gonna wait a moment for you to write that down. I'm gonna refresh myself with some handy Java here, not that Java, the different Java. OK, uh, hit print screen if you didn't write that down, because I'm going to leave the screen and I'm going to show you that particular uh, location. Uh, this will take you to this right here, SQL workshops. If you do that, there's lots of them here for you to play with. But this is the one we're going to be focusing on, which is the big data clusters architecture. You're going to cl uh, click into that. Let me raise the uh, resolution here so you guys can see what I'm clicking on. Uh, you'll notice I'm at CTP 2.3. The current shipping product is 2.4, uh, but that will change. I'm probably not going to rev this course until we get to probably CTP 3.0 uh, because things won't change dramatically. Um, it points mostly at the documentation anyway. I want you, your homework is to read completely through this module, uh, this first page. I want you to read it carefully. Uh, you do not need to go forward. You do not need to go and do more. We're going to do each of these. There's six modules. We're going to do each of them in a one hour session in the modules that follow. Um, and we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, now, you're welcome to read ahead and you're welcome to try things. But if you ask questions on module three, when we're still at module one, I'm going to wait till module three to answer your question. So that's the way that's going to work. Um, here's the setup prerequisites. You do need to have the prerequisites done. I'd like you to have the prerequisites done. Uh, let me just open that. Everything that's here, I need you to do all the prerequisites prior to next week. So just go from here. I think you'll have most of this done, and it's probably a great idea um, to uh, use a virtual machine for this environment because things will be changing. So I'd recommend you install these things on, on a VM. You are able to do this whole workshop on a Mac or even Linux, but I uh, expect Windows is what I'm looking for. If you need a virtual machine, I have uh, free virtual machines for you here. You can click this link and I've got machines for you in VMware, Hyper-V, VirtualBox and Parallels. Uh, and it comes with Visual Studio 2017 pre-installed and they work for 30 days. Uh, so you can just use those. All right, we're going to close out today. I'm going to turn this back over to Pradeep. Pradeep, have you sent out the series of meetings? Uh, you're welcome to um, say what you'd like and then stop the recording whenever you're ready. Have you sent out the series yet or are we doing it week by week? I think uh, Alex will send the complete series. OK, all right. So uh, unless I have a conflict, we'll probably stick to this time, if you will. Uh, you're welcome to join live. There will be a recording. Um, I think there's an advantage to being here live, but I understand if you've got uh, work to do. The, the danger is you're going to say, oh, I'll do that later, and, and you won't. You won't actually do that later. Uh, so it's best if you can commit an hour, just an hour, uh, to looking at the information. Uh, I'd recommend you do the workshop, but you can do it at a pace as we go uh, and know that things will change. I appreciate your time uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, or this uh, night, uh, wherever and what time you're watching this from. Pradeep, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody. If you have questions, uh, buck.woody at microsoft.com. I'll turn Thank it back you, over sir. to you. Yeah. This was an awesome session. We really appreciate your efforts on this one. Uh, it was very well orchestrated. Uh, really happy and glad to listen to this. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, afternoon, or evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.